Well, who here is ready for Christmas? Yeah? <laughs> How many of you here are like me and you hate it when people ask you that question? Because <laughs> everybody asks you that. Are you ready for Christmas? And I just want to be honest, like, no. Like, I'm not ready for today. So forget something that's happening a week from now. I am not ready to be here in this moment with you. Are you ready for Christmas? It's, it's a hard season for so many people because it's supposed to be a season of joy. We're supposed to know this as a season of joy. The songs are about joy. Your shirts say joy, like joy, joy, joy. But honestly, for so many of us, how many of you would say this is true for you? This can be a season of great stress. There's stress around, have we done enough? Do we do everything we're supposed to do? Do we have enough presents in our house? There is stress around, man, it, it's hard to afford all this stuff, right? There's stuff when everything's expensive. This is really going to, it's going to be a struggle this year. There's stress around, do we got to do something? Do we got to go somewhere? Do we need to go on vacation? Even that is expensive. Like, what do my kids expect? There is stress around your family coming over because some of y'all got crazy family coming over to your home and you're like, man, when this guy comes, like, how are things going to go? Because no one knows what he's going to do. And if you don't know any crazy family that you have, then, like, it's probably you. Like, somebody is stressing, somebody is stressing right now that you are coming over and they're wondering, what are we going to do when they show up, right? It can be such a stressful season. And we know that we're stressed because of the way that we respond to, like, little things, right? When something goes wrong, when something doesn't go the way you plan, when something unexpected happens, stress just kind of makes you blow up. And you're supposed to be joyful, but you know all these people at the store. You're seeing them every day, and you're just like, man, nobody in this store is joyful. They are stressed because little things set them off. Like, when you pull into your parking spot, and they wanted your parking spot, Spot, and they show you just a very friendly finger, and they're like, hey, read between the lines, man, like, read between the lines. And so it's just a stressful time because of the way we respond. We do that when we're stressed out. Uh, I remember this happened to me in my life. We had a newborn. Uh, Mariah was, I don't know how old she was, and we're very sleep deprived. So I tried to remember a lot of details from this story. I'm asking Simi, and both of us, like, barely remember this, but this happened. Mariah is a newborn. So we're not getting a lot of sleep. We're stressed. We're trying to figure out this parenting thing. She's in the back seat of the car asleep. I need to get gas. Pull into the gas station. And as I'm about to get out and get gas, these two cars of, this story's going to make me sound like an old person, okay? These two cars of young people pull up next to us, okay? And, and these are like, I think guys that are like freshmen in college. They look young. Two cars full of guys, like 10 guys get out of the car. I mean, they're honking their horns. They're yelling. They're right next to us, right? And so so like curmudgeon who's just not getting enough sleep, I get out of the car. I'm like, listen, you kids, you need to be quiet. You're being so loud. My child is sleeping in the back seat, right? And they did not like that I, I took the liberty to get out of the car and yell at them. So they're both like, who was this guy? And they both start like walking towards us. And I'm just getting more mad as they're walking towards us. Then Simi, my wife, she gets out of the car, right? Like she's going to back me up if one of them has a wife with them. I don't know. And so she gets out of the car and we're just going at it right there in the gas station. And everybody is watching us. And then I realize. Simi's not mad at them. Like, she's at the car for me, right? She's looking at me like, get in this car. <laughs> so I get in the car, and she's like, what are you thinking? Like, are you going to fight these 10 guys? <laughs> like, what are you going to do? And then she says this, and you saw this was coming. She's like, you're a pastor. Like, do you, like, you want to be on the news for getting in a fight at a gas station just because you're sleepy? <laughs> get in the car. So we drove home, and then I came to my senses. So I'm looking at the rearview mirror like, what if they follow us? Like, what did I do? Like, this is a mistake. I shouldn't have done this. But it's what we do when we're stressed. We know we're stressed by the way that we respond. And even though this is supposed to be a season of great joy, great joy, I think a lot of our responses and the, and the way we're going through the day and what we're feeling, just that underlying angst and tension that we experience shows that even though this is a season of great joy, we can experience great hardship in the season. 
There's a season of great joy in the scriptures as well. I laid out some scriptures for you. It's going to come on the screen that show all the places where joy shows up in the Christmas story. We see that the angels were joyful as they sing of God's praise. The shepherds are joyful because they get this incredible message that they're going to take to the rest of the world. The wise men were joyful. They come, they bear gifts, and they come to worship the newborn king. The baby John leaps for joy in his mother's womb just because a pregnant Mary walks into the room. I mean, there is joy all over the Christmas story. And finally, we see that Mary is joyful. We're going to look at that text a little bit today. Mary is filled with joy. But we've got to remember, we, we've got this image of Mary, right? And we, and we see pictures of Mary, and she's always got a halo, and she's always so at peace. In this moment, Mary's life is pretty stressful, And even though she experiences joy, it is clear her joy is not necessarily tied to her circumstances. Her joy is not necessarily tied to her situation. It is not tied to everything being fine and dandy in life. She is stressed out in that moment. There's this rubric that we use to tell if a person is stressed or just to gauge how stressed out this person might be. Are they so stressed that they are in danger? It's called the Holmes Ray Inventory. And and you kind of start at number one and you go down and you see, is this person going through this? Is this person going through this? And they get a point value for everything that they're going through. And so I just looked at this Holmes Ray inventory in the life of Mary at this time just to see how stressed out is Mary at this moment. And we talk about some of the stuff she's got going on. Uh, She's experiencing some serious tension with her significant other. I mean, she's betrothed to be married to Joseph, and and she's like, well, Joseph, guess what? I'm uh, pregnant. And so that's that's a little stressful, right? Joseph is thinking about, man, I, I just got to leave Mary. Like, I can't do this. Like, this is too much. Like, there's no way I can do this. So he's processing all this, and she's processing him processing all that. They go through a reconciliation, but even after their reconciliation, Mary is still pregnant. Man, pregnancy, that scores a bunch of points on the test right there. So she is still pregnant. Uh, we see that they are impoverished. I mean, they're struggling financially. They don't have a lot of money. Later, when Joseph and Mary go to the temple and they're presenting Jesus at the temple, it says that the sacrifice they brought to the temple are these two little birds. And that was an allotment that is in the law for people who don't have enough money to bring a different kind of sacrifice. So here we go. She's a teenager. She's pregnant. Her significant other, her, her, her fiance is thinking about leaving her and she doesn't know how that's going to go. And she doesn't have enough money. And she's about to bring a baby into the world. And the world is in darkness and chaos. We've been talking about that for the past few weeks. Basically, here's where Mary scores. She is at an 80% chance of a health breakdown within the next two years. That's where Mary actually scores on the inventory. But look at her response in these moments. Luke chapter 1 verse 46. Mary says, this is after getting all this news, after learning what's going to happen, after learning that she's going to bring the Messiah into the world, Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit, what's that word? My spirit rejoices All that stuff that I just laid out for you, this is what's going on in her mind. This is what she's worried, stressed out about. This is what's going on in her life. These are her circumstances. But she says, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. What we learn from Mary is the way joy is going to come into our lives in this time of year and every time of year often is that we must choose a joyful perspective. We have to choose a joyful perspective. That's why even under all this stress and duress, she is able to say, my soul rejoices God my Savior. Look what she says there. He has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. Mary says, I'm, I'm in a humble state. She's vulnerable. She is stressed. She's in this difficult culture. She she is poor, like I said, like she doesn't have enough money. She is insignificant in so many ways in the eyes of the world. She recognizes her status in society and who she is. And she goes on to say the most high, the incredible God, the almighty. When it says there, uh, God, my savior, she's using this language from the Old Testament that talks about God as, as a warrior who fights for us. 
God as a warrior who fights our battles. She talks about the mighty God. And then what does she say? He has been mindful of me. He's thinking of me. And he's concerned with me. I'm on his mind. He sees me. That's how we would say it today. He sees me, even in my humble state, even in all the stuff I'm going through, even in all this stress, he sees me. And therefore, regardless of my circumstances, I can say my soul rejoices in the Lord. My friends, I had to live this out this week. I really get annoyed when I have to live out my messages, but I had to live this out this week. Every day this week, without fail, from Monday all the way to yesterday, each day I met with at least one person who this is not just the happiest time of the year for them. And they're walking through difficulty and they're walking through sorrow and struggle. And I thank the Lord for a text where I could say, listen, I know you're going through struggle and I don't know how you're facing it, honestly, because I'm not going through that. It's painful. It is painful. But I need you to recognize We serve a big God who is mindful of the humble state of his servants. And something one person said to me, it really stuck with me for days. He said, you know, things have been so hard right now. I don't even, I don't even know how to verbalize my prayers. He's like, I know God is good and I know God is with me. And there is a joy and a peace that I am experiencing. But honestly, I don't even know what to say when I pray. And he said, I've just been thinking. I've just been thinking my prayers, thinking about the Lord, worshiping God in my thoughts. And I said to him, God is mindful of every thought that you have. Man, God sees every thought, every sorrow, every burden, everything you're stressed about. You don't have to say anything. You can echo what the psalmist when he says, when I, when I think of the stars and all the things that you have created and how vast the expanse of the universe is, and I think that the very God who calls every star by name, when I think that he is mindful of me, I wonder, who am I that he would care about me so much, that he would be so deeply entrenched and involved in my life? I don't know what you're going through today, my brother, my sister. I don't know if you walked into this place thinking, man, this is just a hard time of year for me. I know there's some of you in our church family who have lost loved ones over this year. Some of you maybe lost loved ones over the past few years. And this time of year, it just gets a little harder every year because you're missing someone so deeply, grieving for them so deeply. I want you to know God sees you. He sees your sorrow. He sees your pain. And he is your comforter. So even when life doesn't feel so happy-go-lucky, we can choose a joyful perspective as Mary did. But I want to backtrack in this passage a little bit. What we looked at, the verse we just saw where Mary says, my, my soul rejoices in God my Savior, it kind of comes at the end of all these other things that happen in her life. And, and I want to look at what leads her to that place where she is able to choose a joyful perspective. So the next thing I want to look at is in Luke chapter 1, verse 27. Because before Mary's able to choose a joyful perspective, she's got to claim a very powerful promise that comes to her. The angel Gabriel, he comes to a town named Nazareth. That's where Mary is. And Gabriel is talking to Mary in verse 27. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said to her, greetings, you who are highly favored. Everybody say highly favored. Highly favored. The Lord is with you. That's what we celebrate in this season, Emmanuel, God with us. So Mary gets this call, and Gabriel comes and says, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. And this totally makes sense, right? You have been through this yourself. Like somebody slides into your DMs and they say something like, blessed child of God, you are highly favored. Can you please send me a thousand dollars within the next week because the Lord loves you and the Lord wants to use you, right? You read that language and you're like, this is a little suspect. I don't think I believe this. Like what's going on? So Gabriel comes to Mary and says, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And Mary is a little troubled and she's like, what are you talking about? Right? And I think the reason is, do you remember the the state of Mary's life? 
I think Mary is just looking at her life like, I, I, I don't feel highly favored. I, I feel like a nobody a lot of times. I, I feel very unimportant a lot of times. I feel very ignored most of the time. What are you talking about, Gabe? I'm highly favored. The Lord is with me. Now, there's some other people, and I can tell when I look at their life. I can tell when I see their circumstances. They're highly favored. I know what highly favored looks like. What do you mean I'm highly favored? She's troubled at this. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. Your favor with God is not something you earn. Your favor with God is not something that you gain by your reputation or by what you have or what you own or what you can get or what you build. Your favor with God is a free gift that he gives you. His kindness, his compassion, his grace towards you. And so he says you found favor with God, Mary. And we've got to remember at this time, as we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, I mean, the people of Israel are familiar with these prophecies, but they are 700 years old by this time. Most of them, I believe, have probably lost hope. Things are bad. Things seem to be getting worse. All hope is lost. I think that's how they're living. I think that's how they're experiencing the world. And now the angel comes to Mary and says, you've found favor with God. And then in verse 31 says, you, Mary, will conceive and give birth to a son. And you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. Like I said, Mary is familiar with those prophecies from Isaiah and Micah. She's probably been growing up in little Sunday school learning these prophecies from Isaiah and Micah. But I do not think Mary woke up that morning thinking, gee, I'm a virgin. Like maybe Isaiah was talking about me. Like maybe that could be me. Mary's got a plan for her life. I think Mary's like, I'm going to be engaged. I'm going to be doing this thing. I'm going to try to survive in this difficult world. She has a plan for her life. But here's the question. What if the very means of God's deliverance were to mess up your plans? We looked at that in depth last week. What if the way that God was going to miraculously bring revival to your city was going to smash the plans and the agenda that you have made for your own life? So the angel comes and says, Mary, you are going to be the one who brings the Messiah into this world. And we have to get a grip on this idea because we all have this great hope that God is going to do immeasurably more than we ask or imagine. That God is going to make all things good for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. But what if the way he is going to do it is going to mess up some of your plans? That's what Mary is experiencing there. So she asks in verse 34, Gabriel, how will this be? How will this be? Mary asks because I... I'm still a virgin. Now leave it to a woman to ask a very rational, very logical question in this high stress moment. Gabriel, what are you talking about? Like, it's really not possible for me to be pregnant. The angel answers, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Then he goes on to say, and guess what, Mary? I'll prove it to you. You have a cousin, Elizabeth. She's very old. She hasn't been able to have children her entire life. Guess what? She's also pregnant. Right? And Mary's like, no way, Gabriel, that's impossible. How could that be? And then he says in verse 37, for no word from God will ever fail. No word from God will ever fail, Mary. Doesn't matter if you think you're not good enough. Doesn't matter if you think you're not worthy. Doesn't matter if you don't think God could possibly be with you or use you. Doesn't matter if you've got your whole life laid out and, and, and you have a plan for how everything is going to go. If God speaks into your life, if God begins to move in you, he is able to do anything. And Mary's response, verse 37, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. Man, Mary is a boss, right? <laughs> we have all these people that we think are like the, I mean, not that we think. They are our heroes in the faith. We have biblical uh, narratives and stories, these events that have taken place. We have heroes, people like Moses. But you got to remember when God first comes to Moses and like, Moses, I'm calling you and here's what you got to do. You remember Moses' response? He's like, here I am, Lord. Send somebody else. It's not, 
I don't want to do that. God, I don't speak well. God, I can't do it. I don't measure up. You have no idea. You got the wrong guy. Go find somebody else. Gideon. You know I love Gideon. I named my son Gideon. But when God comes to Gideon, Gideon's like, can't do it. I'm the weakest in my family. My family's the weakest in my clan. Our clan is the weakest among all the other clans. God, you got the wrong guy. Go find somebody else. Jeremiah. Jeremiah's like, God, I'm too young. You want me to say all this crazy stuff? No one's going to listen to me at all. Go find somebody else. We see all of these guys. But Mary, I mean, the angel comes to Mary. and says, Mary, I'm going to blow up your life. Every plan you've made, everything you think the way it's going to go over the next couple of years, I'm going to change all all of it, but God is with you, and the Spirit is going to help you do it, and her response is, here I am. I'm God's servant. Use me. When Mary said yes to God, she gave him permission to work in and through her life in a powerful way, but Mary's yes displayed a willingness to put her plans on hold, to put her agenda on hold, and to trust God for his power to work in and through her life. And the question is, what could God do with your yes? If he's speaking to you right now, if he's been speaking to you, if he's been leading you, if his whispers have been calling you to stretch your faith and follow him, what could God do with your yes? You might be sitting here thinking, this is great for Mary, um, but I don't think my life is going to go that way. I'm nothing like Mary, right? I'm more like how she felt where there's no way I could be highly favored. There's no way God could use me. There's no way God could be with me. That, that word highly favored is so important because in the original language, the root word there is simply grace. It's charis. And most scholars believe there's one unique word used there that's only used one other time in the New Testament. And we find it in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. And it's talking about another who is highly favored. And what we read there from the Apostle Paul is that the glorious grace that God has freely given us, rescues us, makes us his children, and transforms us. So the only other place we see that highly favored being used, who is it talking about? You. Isn't that incredible? It's talking about you. All who are in Christ Jesus. It's saying that same grace that implanted the work and the promise and the miracle of God in the womb of Mary, that same grace comes upon all who believe in Jesus. That grace fills you. That grace changes you. That grace transforms you. So I hope you walk out of this place knowing that you, just as Mary, you are highly favored. His grace has been lavished on you. His grace has been showered on you to do what he has called you to do. So no matter what you go through, no matter what you walk through, how challenging or difficult your circumstances might be, you have been given the grace from God to find joy even in the midst of that. But maybe you're still like, you know what? Okay, fine, I got grace. But I'm definitely more like Moses and Jeremiah and Gideon than I am like Mary. I just don't think I've got what it takes to do what God wants me to do. But here's the thing. In the same way the Holy Spirit overshadowed her life so that she could do what she was called to do, in the same way the Spirit of God works in your life. All of you who are in Christ, you have received this grace. You are highly favored. But here's the promise also for all of you who are in Christ. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Are you seeing where I'm going with this? And then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When God's favor rests on your life, God's power is released in your life. When God's favor rests on your life, God's power is released in your life. And what we see from Mary, a part of discovering joy, even in difficult circumstances, is knowing your purpose. Knowing what God has called you to and what he is going to do in and through your life. I believe this. I believe this, that you will not experience true joy unless and until you are walking in God's purpose for your life. Right? I know that because I, I tried to run. I was like Jonah, right? I tried to run in every direction I could, and life seemed to be going well, and things seemed to be adding up the way I wanted them to, but I had no joy and no fulfillment 
until I surrendered my life, started walking in God's plan, which is a plan I never had for myself. And then I'm telling you, every moment since has been joy filled. And so I'm on this mission to tell everybody, here's what it takes to experience the joy of the Lord, to be strengthened by the joy of the Lord. You must walk in his plan and in his will each day of your life. Then Ephesians 3.20 promises us that he is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power at work within us. Isn't that amazing? So when the power of God comes upon you, you will have power to bring peace where there is conflict. You will have power to bring hope where there is despair. You will have power to bring reconciliation where there is brokenness. You will have the power to bring wise counsel and wisdom to the places where there are where there's foolishness. Most of you work at a place that is filled with foolishness. And I pray that the Spirit of God would give you the wisdom to walk in that place and speak wisdom. Wisdom. The kind of wisdom where everybody's just like, where did you come up with that? Like, where did that come from? That came from you? (laughs) And you could say, it didn't come from me. I know where it came from. That is the Spirit of God at work in me. When the power of God comes upon you, I pray that you would have power to have freedom from addictions and habits and hurts and hang-ups that have held you captive for so long. The power of God comes upon us. So God can do amazing things with your yes, but yes is just the first step. That's what we see in Mary's life. Saying yes to God is just like planting a seed, just like planting a seed. And often, Before that seed flourishes, God is going to walk you through a process on the way to the miracle that he has prepared. And this is what we see in the life of Mary. We must commit to an expectant process. We must commit ourselves to an expectant process. So the angel shows up. Mary, here's what's going to happen. Mary somehow says, yes, I'm in. The spirit of God comes upon her. She is pregnant. She's with Joseph. Everything's going. But then she's got to wait. She's got to wait. And the longer she waits, the more painful, the more uncomfortable, the more difficult things get. I went to my wife uh, because at the beginning of the week, I was able to go to the hospital and visit uh, a newborn baby, the newest member of New Life Bible Church, and her dad just put her in my arms, and I was like, now I don't know what to do. But anyway, <laughs> I'm seeing this baby, and it's got me thinking about babies. So I came home, and I went to my wife, and I was like, Simi, uh, was there ever like a time in your pregnancy where it got uncomfortable or like painful or anything like that? Was there ever a moment... And she gave me one of those looks, like married people know this, where she doesn't have to say anything. She just has to look at you, and you just know, like, you've done something wrong. And she's like, yeah, yeah, Jason, that was the whole pregnancy, the whole pregnancy. I was like, thanks. That's all I needed. I just needed that for my talk. Appreciate it. Love you very much. (laughs) But it's uncomfortable, and it's painful, and it's difficult. And here's the deal. The soil that grows the seed of a miracle is often the soil of adversity. Right? The seed of a miracle grows, flourishes, thrives in the soil of adversity. As Christians, we like to look at people, and we like to say they are highly favored because we're like, oh, look at them. Their life is so perfect. Their life is so successful. Everything they do just works out, man. They get the golden touch. Like That person must be highly favored. And we're not willing to commit to this expected process like Mary I want you to look at Mary's life where she has to deal with just her reputation being torn to shreds in her community. And even then, she's highly favored. She's got to deal with the stress of, is my fiance going to leave me? Is he going to stay with me? Like, what is going to happen? And even there, she is highly favored. And then they finally get married and things seem to be moving forward, but there's a census that means they got to go to Bethlehem. And so in her third trimester of pregnancy, she's got to hop on a donkey and go 90 miles to this town called Bethlehem. Even there, she is highly favored. She gets to Bethlehem. They're like, we got no space for you. We don't know what you're going to do. You look like you're about to pop, so find somewhere and go pop. I don't know what they tell her. Even there, she's highly favored. And when they finally find themselves in a barn, 
I think Mary has got to be thinking to herself, I have failed. I said yes to God. I've come this far, but there is no way that God is going to be okay with me bringing Jesus into this world in a barn that smells like animals and feces and is covered in filth. There's no way that he's going to be pleased with me. I failed. She had to be feeling that way. Even there, she's highly favored. Even there, she's highly favored. Sometimes waiting for the Lord is difficult and it is painful. But if you will commit to the process, then he is able to do more in that moment than you ask or imagine. Mary was committed. She was committed. I think the picture of an expectant mother is actually a great picture for what it looks like for us to walk with God, isn't it? Because expectant mothers, even when they walk through difficulty, even when they walk through uncomfortable times, they will never rush the process. You ever notice that? You, you can ask a mom who's waiting on her baby, like, how do you feel? They'll be like, miserable. It is really bad. And you're like, I bet you wish this process would just rush along. And they'll tell you, no, 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 no. Like, I want my baby to be healthy. I want my baby to be strong. I don't, I don't care how uncomfortable it is for me because I'm looking forward to something bigger and I'm looking forward to something greater. Like, that's what's going to bring me joy. They never rush the process, right? And expectant mothers, they, they change all these things in their life. They're willing to be like, you know what? I, I got to stop eating this. My wife gave up coffee. I mean, that is a, that's a miracle in and of itself. <laughs> when my wife was pregnant, she's like, I'm going to stop drinking coffee. I said, what? But she's like, it's good for the baby. I want to drink coffee. They change the way they eat. They change so many things in their life. Have you ever thought of that? So God comes to you and says, I want to do something incredible through your life. And if you move to the place where you say, okay, yes, God, I'm going to surrender my life. I'm going to surrender my plans. I'm going to surrender my agenda to you. God says, great. I'm going to put my spirit on you. I'm going to empower you to do the very thing that I'm calling you to do. There's going to be power for you to do those things. But then you begin a process. It's just the beginning of the journey. And part of that process is you in your sanctification saying, okay, God, there's some stuff I'm going to get out of my life. There's some stuff I'm going to get out of my life. There's some stuff that I'm going to remove from my heart. Greed, lust, anger, bitterness, envy. There's these things I'm just going to get out of my life, Lord, so that my life is a place where the seed of a miracle can grow and flourish. We prepare ourselves for what God is going to do with joyful expectancy for what is to come. We also prepare the environment around us. Right? A mom is going to start getting a nursery ready and start buying the things she needs, get clothes and diapers, get everything ready for this life to come into the world. And in a lot of ways, following Jesus is the same. You've got to get your circumstances, your environment ready. Fill your life with worship. Fill your life with God's word. Fill your life with prayer because God is birthing something on the inside of you by his power at work in you. But it's requiring something of you. There is a process you got to walk through. And I think there's a lot of people, there's a lot of people who would claim to follow Jesus today who would say, I've got no interest in the process. No, I, I just want I, I just want to be like Mary on the tail end of things. I like Mary 2,000 years later where we just sing about her and we put her picture everywhere and she's famous. I like that Mary. But there's so many of us that are not willing to go through the discomfort and the pain and the challenge that it takes sometimes to bring God's deliverance, his redemption, his glory into this world. But that's what you're called to. If you are in Christ, you have received his grace. You are highly favored. The Spirit of God has overpowered you and works in and through you, but you've got to be willing to walk through the adversity that it may take for God to do what he is calling you to do. So we read in 1 Peter 1, verses 13, with our minds alert and fully sober, we don't set our hope and we don't set our focus on the things of this world or the things that are around us right now. We put our hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. And as obedient children, 
We do not conform to the desires of this world or to the evil desires that we lived in when we lived in ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, so you be holy in all that you do. And I firmly believe this. It is not a popular opinion in this day, but I firmly believe you will not experience the joy of the Lord without walking in holiness. And I say that as a person, I've spent the last 15 years walking with people who say, I know where I'll find joy. I'll find joy by doing whatever I want. I'll find freedom by doing whatever I want. And I walk with them through a process where they find themselves lost, miserable, and absolutely at rock bottom. And as a pastor, I'm able to come in and say, hey, let's try a different way. Let's try walking with the Lord, surrendering your life, your passions, your desires to him. Let's see where he takes you and over and over. And I got story after story after story of people who experienced the joy of the Lord as they followed him with their whole heart and surrendered everything to him with this kind of expectant commitment to the process that God was taking them through. And that's my prayer for you all today. This message is for any of you who walked into this place thinking, man, I'm, I'm just about to give up. I don't know if I've got what it takes to keep going. I don't know how many more years like this I can handle. I want to tell you, you are highly favored. God is with you. His spirit lives in you. He is empowering you. He is strengthening you. And you can discover his joy if you will pursue him with all your heart. And don't buy into this narrative that, that, that being highly favored just means everything is easy in your life and you're going to be comfortable and things are just going to come to you for no reason whatsoever. Sometimes being highly favored means you're going to walk for a season through adversity because that is the place where God is going to grow that miracle that he's going to grow in your life. Amen? And so I want you to be encouraged to give yourself to that, strengthened to give yourself to that.